an addiction is a prison. It's a prison that gets narrower and narrower. The walls close in and the walls are made up of our thoughts. So we really have the key to get out of the prison, but we don't realize it. I feel that people that have addictions are people that are more sensitive. They are aware that there's an emptiness within and are trying to fill it. So really, we have the potential to be leaders in this world and shine a light for everybody and let people know there is a way to fill the emptiness inside. Today on the podcast, we have Bracca Getz. So welcome, Bracca. It's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. So to kick us off, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit about your story of addiction and your childhood growing up. Okay, sure. I began to question things in life at about age 12. And what, like up until then, you know, life just was, but all of a sudden it was like there was an expanded consciousness. And I started to think about things like what was the purpose of life that really began at age 12. I would see people going to work to make money, to buy food, to go to work, to make like, what is this all for? What are we here for? This question, it kept getting at to me and I kept thinking about it more and more through the years. I started a diary at that age. And then when I got older, it became a journal. And it actually, this became my memoir because I took like the excerpts from it and you could see the development of food addictions as I was growing up and then how I healed from them. It covers ages 12 to 32. It's kind of a psychological documentary about how does a person develop addictions and how is it possible to heal? So I, I feel it's, a, you, oh, I write children's books, but this is the only book I wrote for adults because I didn't really write it. I just compiled it from, from my excerpts and, um, and I filled in the missing pieces And it's about how I finally learned how to nourish my hungry soul. That's what the book is about. Take us a bit through that journey. I mean, as a 12-year-old, like I said, to your 30s, you journaled a lot and had your diary and wrote down the sort of development of this addiction. What did you notice in that journal that was developing? Take us through those kind of teen years. Sure. What happened is when... I did not understand how when I was finally able to nourish my soul, why did I no longer have a need for the addictions? What did one thing have to do with the other? So when I found my old diaries, I remember I sat on the floor, I read them, and I said, oh my goodness, now I see the thread. Now I understand what was going through my life, why was I able to finally heal? Because that emptiness inside that we try to fill, when we have addictions, we try desperately to fill the emptiness with externalities. We we try to fill up the hole, but the hole actually gets bigger and bigger through the addiction (laughs) because it's not a physical hall it's a spiritual hall and unless we learn what really nourishes that hungry soul then we can't fill it up what what i finally learned what fills my soul is gratitude gratitude because without it we're always hungry And, you know, food addictions, it's like a very clear analogy, but it applies to drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, um, any type of addiction. It's, It's trying to fill it with these physical externalities, and it never works. It brings temporary, very fleeting comfort, 
but it doesn't give us the lasting pleasure that we're really craving. So like when I was in active addiction, I was, um, I, I would go on these intense diets fluctuating with binge eating, like incredible out of control binge eating. And neither one had anything to do with my real physical hunger. I was not eating because I was physically hungry. I was eating because I wanted lasting pleasure in my life. And I had no idea how to bring that into my life. Um, I think, I, I believe all addictions come from a sense of scarcity. And until you have a trust that there's an abundance of ways to bring pleasure into your own life, then you live in fear with a sense of scarcity. And that's why a person has to keep stuffing their face or whatever other addiction they have in order to try to grasp lasting pleasure because you haven't yet learned the secret to bringing lasting pleasure into your life. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And well said, I feel like gratitude is really important. And like you say, no matter what the drug is, whether it's food or, you know, alcohol, cocaine, whatever the drug may be, we all try and fill a void, a void inside us that we try and fill up. And like you mentioned, as you were growing up, that void was there. When did you first become aware of the void? Yeah, at age 12 was when I suddenly became aware. I don't know, because of, you know, the body changes, hormones, adolescence. Suddenly there was an awakening and understanding that something was missing, but I didn't know what that was. I wasn't brought up in a spiritual way. So I wasn't brought up with an understanding that we're essentially, in essence, we're spiritual beings that need spiritual nourishment in order to thrive in life. So if we're just physical beings, why wasn't that enough? It wasn't. Something in me remained hungry and I didn't know why. Because it was never explained to me that the core of my being, the real me, is a spiritual being. We're just clothed in these bodies, in this physical world. Once I was able to learn, really, I got back my lost heritage. It, and what, what I learned is based on ancient mystical teachings that were basically tossed. And once I was able to bring them back into my life, then I then I got the instructions for living, the basic tools needed to thrive in life, which unfortunately, so many people never get to learn. In fact, that's why I write children's books. I, I've devoted my life to writing children's books because I want to teach children from the earliest in life, the earliest stage in life, how to live a joyful life so they don't have to play catch up and go through a lot of unnecessary pain um, later on in life. So you're trying to teach the children how to be more emotionally aware and get more in touch with that void and their emotions, which is something you wish you had when you were a kid. Exactly. Exactly. And there's one mystical teaching which I would love to share. It's called the pleasure ladder. This has helped me tremendously. There's... Is that okay to... to, to oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'd love yeah. to hear about it. Yeah, tell us okay. about the pleasure ladder. Okay, yeah. The pleasure ladder has five rungs on it. Again, this is not coming from my head. This is nothing I made up. This is ancient. It's actually Kabbalistic teachings. So there's five levels, which from what I understand, it corresponds to our the five fingers on our hand to represent that we have the power to bring pleasure into our lives at any moment. That's really our purpose for being here. Like that we were created to live a life of gratitude, but we've we've gone really off course from that. You know, in this beautiful garden, we take things for granted instead of, like you were saying, mindfully appreciating the abundance of gifts that are here. So there's five levels. It's totally empowering. The lowest level 
are all the, the physical, natural physical pleasures in this world, all the wonderful fruits and vegetables, all the, all the being in nature, music, exercise, movement, dance, yoga, um, swimming, gardening, all these natural physical pleasures are designed to fill us with both physical and spiritual pleasure when we experience them with gratitude. These five levels, they correspond to the five levels of the human soul. So the lowest level of the soul is the part that's connected to the body. So that's why all the physical things that lift us up, all these natural physical pleasures are on the lowest level. They um, they they nourish both our bodies and our souls. Did and you in term, yeah, in terms of the, the, like you say, the lowest level, the physical one, what would be some examples that you um, enjoy from, from that level? Yes, I love, love to give an example of an orange because it's like, it's an unbelievable world in just an orange. So, you know, the fruit... They're all green to begin with because they're camouflaged in with the leaves. And then when they're ready, they become bright and beautiful. They're saying, I'm ready. They're calling us with their beautiful colors. So then we experience um, the sensual pleasure of looking at them. They're beautiful to look at. They smell beautiful. And then like with an orange, the, the sweet juiciness is kept in for months with the peel of the orange. It's amazing. And when we finish eating the orange, we're left with the seeds that are meant to just go out in the world and become infinite more trees and infinite more oranges. So it's like just an orange alone, you can experience it you could you could get so high spiritually and it nourishes you physically by eating just one orange which i love to do it's an amazing thing so you could you see all the all the joy all the care and love and infinite intelligence that's packed into just an orange it's so and that's just one tiny thing in this whole world you know yeah so it's it's so yeah. amazing it's amazing and I think one thing I really love about it is like the presence and the awareness of not just having an orange for orange sake but really considering what the orange means where it came from the fact that it's from you know the universe and it contains all of this power and you eat it and you nourish it and it grows and it go, grows from the green to the orange and yeah it just is so amazing to really think about all of those different levels and the beauty of the physicality of something like an orange that's amazing exactly exactly and compare it, compare it to an orange flavored tangy taffy. You know, even the wrapper of the orange flavored tangy taffy pollutes the environment. It's, 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 it's designed with greed because it's an addictive type of thing. I don't, I, you can't even call it a food because a food is something that's designed to help maintain our bodies, which, you know, Junk like that doesn't do. So it's designed to be addictive. Like the natural foods are designed to be delicious and nutritious, while junk like that is designed to be delicious and addictive. It's actually designed to be addictive. So people don't even have to feel guilt when they you know, overdose on junk food because that's what it was designed to do to your body. Your body is just responding in the way that that type of food was designed. It's it's not designed with infinite intelligence and infinite loving kindness like an orange. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, and it's really important. And like I say, you in your life of a transition from being addicted to the food and the sugar and all of that junk and just consuming it to fill the void to really considering and enjoying the pleasures of something like an orange. Exactly. Exactly. So, and that is just the lowest level of pleasure. Okay, so let's there's... go to the next one. Let's go. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> so the next level up is love. Now, when you hear about love, you think it's dependent on somebody else. So like, 
why are we in addictions where a person gets into an addiction because they feel lonely, bored, estranged, separate. It, it, it comes from a feeling of being cut off. So each level up the pleasure ladder brings more connection. First to another physical thing, a physical thing in the world, then to another being. But how can we bring love into our lives without anybody being there just by thinking about somebody. Let's say even in prison, a person can focus on the virtues of someone that once did a kindness for them, like a grandmother, and be uplifted with a warm emotional feeling to be inspired, to be a better person. If we don't, if the person doesn't have to be physically present, but we have to focus on the virtues of another that takes us out of our aloneness and we feel gratitude toward another being. So that's an even greater and more lasting pleasure than a physical pleasure, love. We can bring it into our lives at any moment. And an addiction is a prison. It's a prison that gets narrower and narrower. The walls close in and the walls are made up of our thoughts. So we really have the key to get out of the prison, but we don't realize it. And that is by changing our thoughts, focusing on another. The minute we do that, like leaving a text message for someone and telling them what you appreciate about them, right away in that moment, the bag of potato chips stops calling your name. It's amazing. Like just by doing that one thing, that showing that one appreciation or just thinking appreciative thoughts about someone else and you don't have that, it's not pulling you to overeat in that moment. It's like, it it works instantaneously like that. Yeah, so, no, that makes that, sense. And yes. that's love and like you say, to get out of that prison of your mind that addiction creates in that kind of small box of thoughts, having that love and that gratitude and even just thinking about gratitude and love and that kindness is really important. And exactly. what would you say to someone that would say, okay, but my mind is so full of negative thoughts about all the shame and all the guilt and all the horrible things I've done and all of the binge I was just on with eating and I don't have any room in my mind for that. What What do you say to people who say that? Exactly. You, you practice on the smallest things. You practice experiencing the love packed into the orange. You practice on the, on the lowest level possible. You practice on the joy that you experience, let's say you don't feel like moving, you don't feel like getting up, turning on them, just do a wrist circle, just do a neck circle, just feel how something so small feels, how does it feel to move? You, 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 you start with the smallest step possible and it, savor the pleasure that you're experiencing. And if you savor it, then you experience it both on a physical level and on a spiritual level, then it also nourishes your hungry soul. So there's a road that you've never traveled on. It's very gravelly and it feels weird and it's hard to go across it. But once a car has been through it many times, it's so much easier. It's the same with gratitude. We're creating neural pathways. It's, it's, it's the lowest part. It's the, it's the lowest part of our brain and the amygdala that that fills us with fear and we don't have enough love we don't have enough pleasure i got to overeat cuz this is giving me immediate pleasure i'll just keep stuffing my face that is the fear part of the brain the scarcity part so if we can pause for one moment we let the neurons travel up here to the prefrontal cortex where we could say is it my body that's hungry or my soul? Something is really hungry. It's a genuine hunger, but it's coming from my core. The core of my being is hungry. How can I fill it? And now we can see an abundance of ways to fill it. People will mention, oh, be in nature, volunteer, all these different things. But now we understand why do these things work? 
because they actually fill up our soul with pleasure. And in order to climb every rung on the pleasure ladder, there's only one price to pay, and that's gratitude. Gratitude is what fills us up. So just practice. The more you practice it, it's like a muscle, and your brain is kind of a muscle. So as you practice it, more and more neural pathways get created, and it becomes easier and easier to practice gratitude. Um, you may f feel your life is filled up with so much negativity. There's so much negative self-talk and self-criticism from childhood or from trauma at any point in life. But there's still that, it's called a still small voice inside you. It's, it's everlastingly resilient. It's still there. It's still shining. But there's all these clouds on top of it blocking the way. As you experience gratitude, it, it creates a warmth and the clouds melt away and it's still shining. So then that's how you begin to shine more and more through nourishing that soul that's, that's still in there, everlastingly resilient. So like what I'm hearing you say is that sense of if your mind is too busy, try and start off small, come back to your body, ground yourself, come back to the body so your mind calms down a bit then start off small, build that neural pathway, start to go down and use the gratitude and the uh, and the thoughts of, of love to really start to build that track on that road and get down that gravel and start to get those first few sort of trips down that neural pathway. And over time, it will build stronger and stronger. And that's how you really go through the pleasure ladder. Exactly. The, the idea of restriction, our bodies rebel. Oh, I don't want to be restricted. No. So you think the opposite. No, I'm going to pour in the joy. This is going to be just pour it in. And how do you pour it in? Through gratitude. This is how you fill up your life with joy. So it's not about restriction. Because when you think that way, that you can't last that long in a restrictive kind of life. But no, this is actually the opposite. It's pour, pour it on. And that's how you, you really live a life of joy because because the joys are infinite you yeah. may feel deprived but you can bring it into your life through gratitude yeah. yeah and like you say it's kind of from the addictive perspective we're in a sense of scarcity and we need to go and switch to the abundance which is really really important and in terms of the pleasure ladder we've been over physical we've been over love now take us on to meaning tell us a bit more about that Thank you so much. Yeah. So the next level up, even more pleasure, even more connection is meaning. This is when you do something good and meaningful in the world. The funny thing is you don't even have to do it. Just thinking about it already helps you. But an example, I was on another show and the host said he had he was feeling kind of miserable. He was sitting by himself. He had two slices of pizza and he was about to plow through the rest of the box of pizza. His neighbor knocks on the door. He needs his help for two minutes. He helps his neighbor, comes back. He doesn't want the pizza anymore. He puts the rest in the fridge for another day. What happened? In those two minutes, he filled up. He filled up doing something meaningful for another person he got out of himself. It's amazing. So that's how we all are. Let's say even thinking about doing something meaningful, we suddenly don't need to finish the entire container of ice cream or the whole box of chocolate chip cookies. It doesn't call our name in the same way when we fill up doing something for others. It's, it's just how it works. <laughs> um, or even thinking about it. That's the amazing thing. So this is surprising. What's even higher than meaning is creativity. It's when you put a unique part of yourself into the world. And when we do this, you know, when you're doing something creative, you'll notice you don't feel like eating or sleeping. You're in a zone where like time you don't even know time is passing. It's such a high zone of pleasure. So that is even higher. This is why 
all these things we hear work, but we never knew why before. Now we can understand why. Because each level up is bringing us a greater connection actually to the cosmic oneness in this world. And as we sense that that's what we all yearn for, that ultimate unconditional love, the unconditional love that's in the orange. So the highest level of all is transcendence. It's when we transcend our own limitations, when we make that first crack in a bad habit, the first crack in an addiction, we transcend our old selves and break into something new. But it's really, it's really breaking through to our core, to, to the core infinite goodness that we always had within us. And it's, it's just been waiting to be released again, you know, break off from all those coverings. And it's also transcendence is also when we sense we're a part of the greater oneness, like under a starry, starry sky at night, that stays with us forever, those kind of feelings, you know, and um, we can get glimpses of that. And those glimpses of the starry night, they stay inside of us. And we transcendence is recognizing that we are connected to everybody and we're all connected to the same energy source and transcendence is the sense of oneness because here we are feeling before we climb the ladder at all we're feeling disconnected completely alone transcendence we're feeling connection with everybody and everyone the veils of separation lift and we see the oneness we appreciate it so like i said each the way the only thing we need to pay to climb this ladder is gratitude and it's it's available to each one of us that's really our purpose for being here yeah that's amazing that's amazing and like you say they're the five levels you have transcendence creativity meaning love and then the physical world and what are some of the things that is challenging to climb them where do people get stuck where do they find it hard in terms of their ability to to climb them yes great question like relapse relapse is you know it it hardly ever happens to me anymore i mean this has been 40 years for me now of practicing this you know but still let's say i go to a party and i don't feel comfortable i don't really know people and i feel like overeating cuz i'm i'm just so uncomfortable there what am i going to do what should i do i look around for someone else that i think also looks lonely and out of place maybe i can connect with them you know start to feel a connection or i try to eat the healthy things that are there or I go outside for a few minutes, get into the nature. You know, there's once you know what works, you can try to do any of these things to avoid eating the addictive food, getting back into your addiction. In other words, changing the environmental factors that tend to bring you back to your addiction and substituting in the things that fill you up with lasting pleasure. It, it gives you a real clarity of what works. Um, the other thing I like to tell people is this. You can also ask a question, like let's say you feel like overeating. You say, hmm, are 95 more spoonfuls of this ice cream going to fill me up? Because you know they won't. Right away, you know it's never going to fill me up. I'm going to feel emptier than ever when I finish this whole container of ice cream. But here's the thing also. Let's say you do relapse. And what the inner critic is going to tell you is, look, you've already eaten this. It doesn't matter what you eat now. Just keep going. So you can use gratitude again. You could use this. You can outsmart that voice. And you could say, okay. I just ate 10 candy bars, but I didn't eat 50 candy bars. I'm grateful I didn't eat 50. And if you ate 50 candy bars, you say, I'm grateful I didn't eat 250 candy bars. There's always something to be grateful for. My newest book for children, I got to show you, it's called Don't Read This Book. It's written in the voice of the inner critic. 
it 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 so the 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 inner critic is telling you don't read this book i don't want you to learn my tricks cuz the whole book is teaching very young children the tricks the main trick that this voice uses inside your head and it's there all day long it says to you you're missing out on this you're lacking that this person has this and you don't have it this book took me 30 years to write because like I had the title of the book and I had pieces of the book all through the years, but only last year did I get the surprise ending. And this is the surprise ending. This is what I'm teaching really young children and they get the message. That voice, this is such a surprise. It took me all these years to get it. That voice inside your head that's telling you to focus on what you're missing, it really doesn't want you to listen to it. It wants you to push it off and gain gratitude muscles. It's like a dumbbell that you're lifting. It's it's doing it. You're exercising your muscles when it pushes against you. So push it off and say, oh, no, it's you. Got it. It's your it's the voice trying to make me miserable. But I that's not me. Me is my soul. I am going to push it off and be grateful for what I have right now. It works that very minute. Yeah, that's really amazing. So it's about taking a step back from that voice, realizing you're not that inner critic, you're not that voice, and observing it and and pushing it away, and then coming in with some gratitude and thinking about the gratitude of that perspective and feeling grateful for what's going on. And I often feel like myself lack and gratitude or, or lack is the enemy of gratitude right if I'm feeling in lack and looking at social media and I don't have all these things and I'm not where I want to be and you know when we're comparing ourselves to the world and everything we should be and could be and are meant to be we're not in gratitude right but when exactly. we're focusing on what we have how we're abundant how we're uh, full up and how we've been doing really well and we're having good self-talk and managing that self-love and really filling up our own cup that's when we're flourishing, right? And we start to reach that level of transcendence and when we can be creative and have meaning in our life and truly accept love and be loved and appreciate the simple things as simple as an orange. Exactly right, exactly. I believe that the pandemic, you know, it happened to all of us. I feel it was a huge push forward spiritually for all of us to not take things for granted because like overnight we lost so much and suddenly we began to appreciate being with another person being able to move freely in the world our health our breathing things that we were taking for granted one day the next day they had much more value and we're being pushed forward. I think addictions are widespread now because, again, it's a huge push forward spiritually. I feel that people that have addictions are people that are more sensitive, very sensitive people. They are aware that there's an emptiness within and are trying to fill it. And we just didn't have the tools. We didn't know how. So really, we have the potential to be leaders in this world and shine a light for everybody and let people know there is a way to fill the emptiness inside and to live a joyful life. Well, you say COVID did have a big impact on the world and it, and it um, created a lot of gratitude and taught us the importance and how much we value the quote unquote little things in life, even though we realize they're actually quite big things. And, yes. you know even just going for a simple walk was just a, a joy and really amazing. Appreciating the local area, just walking around the block, not being able to go far from your house if you were allowed to leave at all, right? Just yes. those simple things just became so joyous and grateful. Exactly, exactly. It happened to all of us. We, we, we became changed people overnight, exactly. Yeah. 
And one thing that I wanted to talk to you about is the books, right? You said you write the books for the kids, like the book you just showed us. And I have a lot of mums that I work with and they listen to the podcast and a lot of dads as well. And a lot of parents that don't want to necessarily pass down that generational trauma or want to pass on those behaviours to those kids. And they want to teach their kids how to regulate their emotions better. Um, and even myself, you know, as a kid with a mum who, who was a drug addict, you know, I would love to have read those books when I was a kid. I would love to have read all of them, right? So tell us a bit more about the books and why you chose to write the books for the kids and tell us a bit more about that. Yes, exactly. I try to write the books that I wished I had as a child. Um, you know, I ended up going to Harvard because I was searching for ultimate wisdom. That's not exactly what I found there because I really needed spiritual wisdom and at that time, that's not what I learned. So my background, though, was in public health. And even as an undergraduate, I took courses at Harvard Medical School and the Graduate School of Public Health, and I went on to medical school. But what really I spend my life doing is this, helping people from the youngest age possible to know why life is worth living, and giving them the tools to live joyfully. And, and some of my books do have to do with health. Like I wrote Let's Stay Healthy during the pandemic because parents were asking for it. Why? Why is it important to eat healthy food? Why is it important to exercise, to get good sleep? Nobody explains to the children or rarely why these things are important. So children love to know why. And that's what I explain because my background is in science and I love it. I explain why it works. Like when we eat food that isn't healthy, our body responds, what are you giving me? Because, like, just like when you get a saw, when you get a cut and the body starts rushing to heal, the same thing when an unnatural substance comes into our body, the body's going, oh my goodness. And that's what causes the inflammation that we hear about that leads to disease. And so many young people now getting diabetes. It's really unfortunate. And we can, we have the power to change this. So much of our lifestyle can affect how we thrive in life physically and spiritually. So all my books, I have books about swimming safely, like all kinds of books that are both about how to help sh souls shine fully, both spiritually and physically. That's amazing. And like you say, you have a lot of parents who reach out to you and ask you to write about different topics. Is there any in particular that you've wrote about recently that you really enjoyed? Yes, in fact, and a, a strange thing, is that I've written two books about the prevention of abuse because abuse puts such a covering over children's shining souls. And so the more that we can help to prevent abuse, the better. And what's surprising to me is that children will come up to me and tell me those are their favorite books. I never expected that. I, I thought parents would love these books, but the children... They want to feel safe in this world. They want guidelines. They, they want to be told how to be most effective in this world. I, I, hundreds of thousands of those books have been sold. And it's a great joy to me because it actually is saving children's lives. That's, that's what I love to do. To, to, to save, my life was saved. I really... I was at a point where people could read about it in my memoir, Nourish the Soul. I did not want to live any longer. And then everything changed around when I, I learned about the ancient mystical wisdom that I had not known about and about how to live a life of gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. And when that first showed up in your life, how did you start to integrate the, the pleasure ladder on those five levels how did that start to integrate into your life? Yes. It, it, in the book, I detail how it went. Like right away, I saw, oh my goodness, this truth is shining. It's filling me up. But I couldn't integrate it immediately. I would still have some binges. They became less frequent. It would go on like that until gradually I noticed, 
huh, I haven't been binging lately. What's changed, you know? And that's how you see there's no longer a need any longer. Once you're, you're filling up, there's so much pleasure available that we have the power to bring into our lives. A lot of um, addictions come from feeling out of control, feeling that you're not in control and the world is a scary place. Everything happens randomly. When that changes, my whole perspective was different. I felt that the world had turned gray. There were no morals left. My life's worth didn't matter to me. Everything was different now. The colors are there in all the trees outside. My window. It's, it's a beautiful world. What changed now, I trust that there's an ultimate goodness in, in the world. There's an ultimate purpose and that there's an ultimate goodness inside of every one of us, even if it's been covered up by our, our coping behaviors, our addictions, what we did in order to cope with the pain in our life, now we have tools that we can use to move those blockages away. Having the tools and, you know, the pleasure ladder is amazing to be able to have the gratitude and fill ourselves up and have that self-love. And for you, um, well, with food in, in general, it's like a progress addiction, right? It's not like black and white where you can never smoke a cigarette again and you're still going to be alive. With food, you have to eat the rest of our lives. So it's a progress right. addiction. I mean, how have you managed that over the past, you know, many, many years? You've been in recovery a long time. How have you managed that? And what's that been like? Has there been any challenges or ups and downs? Yes, there have definitely been ups and downs. But the more that you eat healthfully, and with gratitude, it just becomes easier. When I, I another show host told me that now when he looks at a junk food, he doesn't see the label saying potato chips. He sees it saying hypertension, diabetes. That's what his eyes see now on top of the packages. He doesn't even see what it says. It, that's what he, and that's kind of how I look at it. Like, why would someone want to eat that? You know, it's not helpful. It's not helpful to my body and it's not helpful to my soul. So it doesn't pull me as it used to. It just doesn't have that effect. I, I fill up on eating healthful foods and it brings me a lot of joy. So it, from what I understand, it's like all of the junk food and unhealthy food in that category is over there. Then healthy food is here and you have the healthy food, but you just don't have the junk food, right? You just don't have the junk food and that's the way that it works. I, I have, let's put it this way, I don't make it that it's illegal or it's forbidden. If I have some of it, you know, like, for instance, I love pizza. I don't consider that such a junk. I don't know. So, like, whatever, you know, but I know that, like, why should I overeat it? I might also feel like eating the whole box of pizza. I enjoy it a lot. But then I say to myself, why should you? Afterwards, it's not going to fill you up. It's, you're not going to feel better. You want to feel gratitude. So think of all the other ways you could fill up. And that's what gets me up from the table, doing something else, or even just knowing that there's an abundance of ways to bring pleasure into my life. It doesn't have to be eating the entire box of pizza. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. And one thing you said that stuck out to me is, is it my body that's hungry or my soul? And I'm just going to say that again because I thought it was so amazing. Is it my body that's hungry or my soul? And I think that was just really stuck out to me because, like you say, even in the here and now, if there's a whole pizza, it's not just about what you eat. It's about the quantity and why you're eating it as well, right? So it's like if there's a whole pizza there, am I going to eat the whole pizza and order another pizza and just scuff my face? Or is it that I can just have a couple of slices and recognize what my soul needs and I can go and focus on the physical world, on love, on meaning, creativity, transcendence, and focus my energy on the gratitude and what is going to nurture my soul rather than just filling it with a junk food. And I think it's about being mindful and aware of that choice and focusing on the gratitude and not on filling the emptiness. And the more you focus on filling the gratitude, the less emptiness there is anyway, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And on your journey, has there been any particular person or mentor that really helped you in your recovery? Yeah, well, there was. It was 
back then, as a young adult, it was Rabbi Noach Weinberg. He's no longer alive. And he is the person that taught about the pleasure ladder. It was revolutionary. He it, it was based on ancient mystical wisdom, but he put it into words that people today could relate to. And that changed my life. And I, I have a graphic of the pleasure ladder on my website with much more details, like explaining the things I explained today. People can download it for free, a copy, just it's like a chart. And they could, they could put it on their fridge or their cabinet, any place to remind them of the abundance of pleasures that, that, that you have the power to bring into your life at any moment of your, of your life. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So for everyone listening, they can go to the website and go to the link down below. And that's going to take you over to the pleasure ladder where you can go and download it. Um, so that's not a problem at all. And also to all of your books, we'll link all of that down below in the show notes. Um, so they can go and find all your books because I think they're amazing. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with the audience today? Anything else on your mind? Well, it's a lot like planting an orange seed, overcoming an addiction. You plant a tiny seed and that's all you really have to do at any moment. And that tiny seed, you know what it can become with the right conditions. It becomes a tree. It becomes an infinite amount of more oranges. So you can be fruitful in this world in so many ways. Through your addiction, you can help so many other people like you're doing. I mean, you know, you, you were given a, a, a many challenges from the beginning of your life. And look what you're doing now to help so many countless people. I think, you know, one of the things that's really important is that gratitude is being grateful, right? It's being grateful for the situation you've you've been born in. And one quote that always comes to my mind is, you have to play the cards you were dealt as if they were the cards you wanted, right? You know, I could have had a worse childhood or a better childhood or whatever contrast frame you want to look at it for, but it's about being grateful of what I did get and... You know, one thing I said on many podcasts myself and I say a lot is that my mum's life wasn't an example. It was her death that was the lesson, right? Because mm. she passed away. And it really reminds me that I use it as a sense of gratitude to remind myself what not to do, that I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to die from addiction. And I think that's really, really important. So I think gratitude is important and really focusing on the importance of of being grateful in life and yeah it's been an amazing conversation thanks very much for coming on the show today thank you such a pleasure to be with you may may you be blessed with continued success in your great work thanks very much thank you